Yeah, I'll, I want to echo what Irina said about um, attending lectures and so on. I think in general, you should have the goal of understanding something or getting some idea out of it, not necessarily the goal of understanding everything, which is an ideal um, one can rarely meet. Um, I'm speaking for myself, uh, based on personal experience at least. Um, so, uh, right. So in some sense, uh, after a slight digression into K2 and uh, uh, um, oh, there's a question already in the chat. Um, the clever trick. Yes, you can find it in this book of Milner's, um, which I already referred to, um, which is also listed in the, um, I put list of references in the, uh, I give an outline of my lectures. Uh, and it includes some books that are relevant to the material we've been discussing. And Milner's book is listed in that in there. Yeah, thanks, Freddie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks for, okay, perfect. Everyone's chiming in with the relevant links and everything, great. Okay, so we're in some sense gonna come back to our roots here and talk about quadratic forms. Um, and so, so well, our main character today is gonna be a quadratic form Uh, over the rational numbers. So just, you could think of it just as a homogeneous polynomial, of, uh, a degree two homogeneous polynomial with rational coefficients. And well, for every place V, uh, uh, you then get a quadratic form over the completion QV. Now I recall that a place V is either a, a prime P and then the QP is the P addicts, or it's just a formal thing called infinity where Q infinity is the real number. So these places are just a way of parameterizing the, the possible completions of the rational numbers that we've been discussing. But so if you have a quadratic form over Q, you get a quadratic form over QV, just Q nu, sorry. Just take the, just take the same coefficients, so to speak, in your a homogeneous polynomial. So it has, these, these ones will have rational coefficients, but now we're interested in them as quadratic forms over this bigger field. So questions about zeros or a number being represented, well, in other words, we're allowing the variables, uh, for example, to live in Q nu and not just in Q, even though the coefficients are still in Q, okay? Um, and the main theme of Haas and Minkowski is uh, a theme called the local global principle, um, which is not a, you know, a general principle that's always valid, but it is valid in some examples, uh, including in the case of quadratic forms, and that will be essentially the Haas Minkowski theorem. Uh, knowledge, I'll, I'll say it, you know, of FV gives you knowledge of V. Uh, sorry, F mu, knowledge of F mu for all mu uh, gives you knowledge of F. So if you know how your quadratic form behaves locally, that is at every completion at every prime and, and in prime at infinity, um, then you should know a lot about your quadratic form F. Um, so that's the general framework in which the Haas Minkowski theorem operates, this local global framework. And now let me state it precisely. Um, and there are actually three different forms. Um, oh, not forms as in quadratic forms, but three different, well, theorem three parts, let's say, uh, three different manifestations of this global, local global principle, which the theorem says are satisfied. And the first one is that if F mu is isotropic uh, for all mu, then F is isotropic. Recall that isotropic just means that it has a non-trivial zero. Yeah, this homogeneous uh, degree two polynomial has a non-trivial zero. So if you can find a zero in all of these Q nu's, then you can find a rational zero. And this is actually kind of shocking because, well, we saw you have very various techniques for producing zeros in the in the QPs, for example, Hensel's lemma, and they're generally kind of an analytic process, like this Newton's method, for example, for finding zeros in R. You're allowed to use analytic tricks, and you're allowed, allowed, allowed to write infinite convergent series to to produce your solutions. And you can do it completely independently in all the places. And then somehow this theorem is saying that magically guarantees you that there is some rational solution. So you can do analytic work at every place uh, to produce local solutions. And then magically there has to be a so-called global solution, a, 
a, a rational solution as well. So that's quite shocking and powerful. Um, the second part is, well, now, we, now instead of just having, oh no, well, yeah. Now, instead of just having my uh, quadratic form F, I'll also take um, a, a, a rational number A in Q. And then I'll say, if F nu represents A for all uh, nu, then F represents A. So that F means that you can solve, this means you can, if you can solve the equation F nu of, of your variables equals A, where the variables lie in Q mu for all mu, you can solve that. Then you can solve it in Q as well. So it's the same kind of thing, except instead of asking where F is equal to zero, you ask it when, when F is equal to some A, right? So it's a generalization of, of one. Um, instead of asking just about the zero sets of your polynomial, you ask about the level sets. Yes, so there is. But uh, about what you just said, however, we cannot say that we can get one from two because when we say represent, we also allow the zero vector to represent something. So I guess one wouldn't follow from two, right? We wouldn't uh, be able to apply two for a is equal to zero and actually get one because represent. Yes, you're, that's a very good point. Indeed, yeah. yeah. So you can go from two to one technically. Yes, yes, yes. Indeed, thank you. Yes. So what Eleutherus is saying is that, well, if a in the case where a equals you wanted to use this one a equals zero, but the, when you ask it to represent zero, you don't. That doesn't include the condition that it's a non-trivial zero of f. Yeah. So thank you for that precision. And in fact, what we're going to see is that one implies two, and that's the the correct implication. But not for f. You have to change change the form. But yeah. Um, yes. And then the third form. So instead of just having f, we also have a g. So f and g are two quadratic forms. Now, if uh, so, there are those correspond to quadratic spaces, right? And we have this notion of isomorphism of quadratic spaces. And so, if f nu is isomorphic to g nu uh, for all nu, then f is isomorphic to g. And that uh, that just this notion of isomorphism of quadratic spaces just corresponds to saying that you can get from f to g by some linear change of variables. Um, so, it's saying if there's a linear change of variables which turns f nu into g nu for all nu. And again, the linear, the linear variables are allowed to be in q nu, and you can select them completely independently of each other as nu varies. Um, then there has to be some rational uh, linear change of variables that connects f to g. Um, OK. So those are the um, three forms of the hasse minkowski theorem. Um, the first thing I'd like to explain is that, and it comes from something that Akil already taught us, um, that the form number one implies both form number two and form number three. So the, uh, Akil taught us this general principle that the question of whether a quadratic form is isotropic or not is the sort of most basic question you can ask about um, a quadratic form. So let me just go through the argument Akil gave, but in this specific instance. Um, so. So the remark is that one implies two and three. Um, so let's start by showing that one implies two. Um, so, well, well, recall in general that F represents A if and only if the quadratic form you get by just uh, adding a new variable, let's call it uh, Z. So, and looking at F minus A Z squared um, uh, is isotropic. Um, so if F nu represents A for all nu, then F nu minus AZ squared is isotropic. Um, and this is over a general field, yeah, not, not just over the rational numbers. And um, then F nu minus AZ squared is isotropic for all nu. Therefore, by form one of the theorem, F minus uh, AZ squared is isotropic over Q, and therefore F represents A. So um, it's just this uh, general trick of reducing the representability question to an isotropic question, but with one extra variable. Um, there's something in the chat. Don't we need Z to be non-zero? Yeah, you I mean, it, I, I'm not saying it's entirely obvious that this equivalence holds. You need to do, you do need to check some cases and so on. But, um, but no, indeed, this equivalence is, is literally true as stated. Yeah, so yeah, Niven is giving the argument. Thank you very much. Yep. 
So you do have to split into cases in the proof, but nonetheless, when you look at the cases, you see everything's okay. Yep. Okay. Um, now for one implies three, this is a little more complicated and it uses these width, these theorems of fit, these cancellation theorems and, and nonsense about splitting off a hyperbolic and so on. So let me see if I can get it right. <laughs> so, um, so right, um, well, so if F, F and G are two quadratic forms over Q, so, well, note that F represents A for some A. And we can even take A to be non-zero. You just choose some random value of A of F, right? Random non-zero value of F. Um, and then this tells us then that, um, yeah, uh, F minus A Z squared uh, is isotropic. Um, and that means that we can write by Witt's cancellation theorem. No, no, by Witt's uh, hyperbolic theorem. Um, so it's an isotropic one, so we can split off a hyperbolic form. So we have F minus AZ squared is isomorphic to some H direct sum uh, F prime. So. Um, now, this form is isotropic. Um, and uh, I, think, I think I'm going to get a little confused about this, so I better open up my notes. Um, it just tells me I'm going to get confused in the course of this proof. All right. Um, right. F minus AZ squared is isotropic, but F is isomorphic to G over, over Q nu for every nu. So this also implies uh, that uh, you know, uh, uh, G nu minus AZ squared is isotropic uh, for all nu, just because G nu is isomorphic to F nu. And therefore by part one, this implies that G minus AZ squared is isotropic over, over Q. Um, so now here, here we're using part one. So then again, uh, we can use the Witt theorem again and we get a similar statement for G. So G minus AZ squared is isomorphic to hyperbolic plane direct sum sum G prime. Okay, um, now we're gonna use induction on the number of variables. So we're gonna assume the statement is true for, no, note that the hyperbolic plane has dimension two and this has dimension one. So this has, F prime has dimension one less than F or the number of variables is one less than F. Um, so now uh, on the other hand, so F is isomorphic to G, therefore F minus AZ squared is isomorphic to G minus AZ squared. Therefore H direct sum F prime is isomorphic to H direct sum G prime. Therefore, by Witt cancellation, F prime is isomorphic to G prime. Um, oh, I mean, uh, yeah, over, over mu for every mu, I mean. Um, but then by induction, we get that F prime is isomorphic to G prime over Q. And then that means that then H direct sum F prime is isomorphic to H direct sum G prime. And then by Witt cancellation, again, we can cross these terms out and we get that F is isomorphic to G. So, <laughs> right, so, so we have F direct sum something is isomorphic to H, uh, uh, H direct sum some other thing. And it's the same, and these guys are the same. So by bit cancellation, the question of whether F is isomorphic to G is equivalent to the question of whether F prime is isomorphic to G prime. And that holds over both Q and all the completions Q nu. So in this way, you look at it and you see that you can conclude by induction. Um, so yeah, if you're a little confused by the logic of it, you're not alone. Uh, I'm also a little confused. I have to write it down every time. Um, but you should just remember the general principles, yeah? The bit cancellation and the trick of um, representability of being equivalent to isotropic. Um, yes, there's a question, Eleutherius? No? Oh. Uh, oh, there isn't? Oh, your hand is not? No, uh, no, no, no. I, I didn't have a question. I was just thinking. <laughs> Oh, I thought it, it, there's a marker that says your hand is up. But, oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot to lower it. Sorry about oh, that. Okay, no problem. Um, okay. So. I want to make another remark. Um, this is special to to degree two equations. Well, or it doesn't hold, 
this theorem, I mean, it, what I mean to say is it doesn't hold in general for higher degree equations. And in fact, there's an example of Selmer um, that if you switch from degree two to degree three, there's failure. So if you look at three X cubed plus four Y cubed plus five Z cubed equals zero, this has non-trivial solutions in Q nu for all nu but no non-trivial solutions. In Q. So this is the failure of the local global principle. Um, so it's in general easier to detect whether or not you have solutions in Q nu than in Q. So this part showing that you have non-trivial solutions in Q nu, that you can do um, using uh, techniques that you have. For example, um, what's it called? Um, the Hensel's lemma. Um, Hensel's lemma gives a way to approach this part. And in fact, I put it as an exercise on the problem set to show that this equation does have solutions in Q nu for all nu. On the other hand, showing that it doesn't have any solutions over Q is, is quite difficult. So I didn't put that on the problem set. Um, the correct context for this example is actually the theory of elliptic curves. Um, so it turns out this Selmer equation gives something which is called a, it's a, a, a torsor for an elliptic curve over Q, which becomes a trivial torsor over Q nu for all nu, but is not trivial over Q. And it, so it represents an element in what's called the tate shafarevich group of a certain elliptic curve. And that's, and the, the general theory of elliptic curves gives a way to, uh, to check things like this. Um, well, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't give a, it, it gives a potential way. I mean, you have to check in any example whether the algorithm actually terminates or not. But in this case, uh, the algorithm does terminate. Um, and it's conjectured to always in, uh, terminate, it's not known. Um, so yeah, this, the general context for Selmer's example is the theory of elliptic curves, which is certain cubic equations. And there's one degree of complexity higher than the quadratic equations we're talking about here. So that's just to situate this in the, you know, in the massive realm of further mathematics. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, the next thing I want to remark, um, and again, it's not a, yeah, it's just sort of a meta remark. Uh, this, the proof of this theorem is difficult. It relies on, um, besides a number of clever tricks, you could say, it also relies on two big theorems. Two big theorems in number theory. So one is, well, the, the Hilbert product formula, Hilbert reciprocity, which we proved, well, which we almost proved last time. Um, and this, oh, I see that the sun is annoying me again. Oh, darn. Okay, there we go. Um, and the second thing is Dirichlet's theorem on primes and arithmetic progressions. So I don't want to write it down, but I'll say it in words. What Dirichlet's theorem says is that if you have a, a positive integer m and you have a congruence class mod m, which is uh, relatively prime to m, yeah, so a, a congruence class of integers relatively prime to m, then there does exist at least one prime number living in that, representing that congruence class. So for example, uh, there's always going to be a prime congruent to one mod m. There's always going to be a prime congruent to minus one mod m, and you know if m is a prime, then there's always a. Yeah. Um, and in fact, it says something more. It says there's infinitely many such primes, and uh, it says something even more than that. But let me stop there. Um, and uh, yeah, the proof uses analytic number theory. It's an, a beautiful proof, and we'll have some of the at least some of the tools um, involved in giving the proof by the end of the next week. That's, a, that's my ambitious plan. We're going to be talking about Dirichlet L series, at least. And those are one of the ingredients, but, well, the main ingredient in the, the proof of Dirichlet's theorem. Um, so yeah. And it, it should be not quite obvious how you're ever going to use these two theorems to prove a local global principle. So it all comes 
in the you have to really look into the intricate nature of the argument to see why these two ingredients could possibly be used to prove such a statement to produce a rational um, solution to an equation. So at least not obvious a priori to me that these would be helpful. Um, okay. Uh, right. So now, um, before diving into the proof, I want to collect a few lemmas that are going to be useful in the course of the proof. Um, so the, the proof will actually, uh, proof will be by induction on the number of variables. And in the induction step, in, you know, and to, to, to make the induction run, you're going to sort of split up your equation into, you know, you can assume it's diagonalized, right? So you just only have terms x i squared in it. And you're going to try to split it up and um, with a grouping of two, uh, you'll just separate out two of the variables and then the remainder of them. And you'll try to use some induction of that form. So that the crucial case is going to be some of the low variable cases, like two variables and three variables, essentially, to make the induction run. There's just going to be a couple of lemmas concerning, um, yeah, such low, vari uh, low variable equations. Um, so, right, so here's one lemma. Um, and this is a local lemma. So uh, let V be a place of Q. Um, and let uh, A uh, be in uh, Q nu such that, yeah, I guess AX squared plus BY squared is non-degenerate. Um, so, um, uh, and let also C in Q mu cross. Well, I guess I, guess I should just take A. Yeah. Um, um, that's uh, it's the same, saying the same thing. So uh, just make everything non-zero in Q mu cross. Uh, then, uh, AX squared plus BY squared represents C if and only if uh, you have a certain equality of Hilbert symbols. So A comma B sub mu uh, is equal to C comma minus A times B sub mu. Okay. Um, so for the proof, um, well, AX squared plus BY squared represents C if and only if, well, A over C X squared plus B over C Y squared represents one. And that's the same thing as saying that uh, A over C X squared plus b over c y squared minus z squared is isotropic. And that by definition of the Hilbert symbol uh, is the same thing as saying that the Hilbert symbol a over c comma b over c uh, nu is equal to one. Um, now we're just going to expand out this equation using the bilinearity of the, the Hilbert symbol. So, so this is the same thing as saying that uh, a comma b. I have to get get it right, right? Uh, you have to. Be, you know, it's a little bit subtle this bilinearity. But, uh, it turns into a b comma b c comma c uh, equals a comma c uh, b comma c. I should, it should be C comma B, but the Hilbert symbol is symmetric. So I'll write it as B comma C. Um, so these are kind of the cross terms. There's like A paired with B and then C paired with C. And it doesn't matter that it's divided because we're taking values in a group of order two. Um, so I'll, I keep it the way it is. Um, and yeah, so it, it turns into this when you use bilinearity. Um, but now we can use this. This is equal to uh, A B comma C new. Or maybe for purposes of proving the precise statement I had, well, uh, I should write it as C comma A B anyway. Uh, and this here is equal to, we can write it as um, C comma minus one um, times C comma minus C uh, mu. But this term always drops out, right? That was a general fact about Hilbert symbols that 
uh, you know, x comma minus x always gives you something trivial. Or it's a general fact about Steinberg symbols, in fact, that Akil explained. Um, and now we can move this over to the other side and use bilinearity again, and we get that it's equivalent to uh, a b mu is equal to minus a, a times b c mu. So a comma b mu is equal to minus a b comma c mu, just again by bilinearity. Okay, that's that's the proof of that lemma. Um, And the other lemma is actually something that Akhil explained, but maybe not in full generality. Um, so uh, it's again about just degree two equations. So well, now it's going to be over an arbitrary field because we'll be applying it for both the rational numbers and for the completions of the rational numbers. Maybe I should say characteristic different from two. Uh, and again, I'll take A and B and K cross. Uh, then. Um, uh, uh, AX squared plus BY squared uh, minus Z squared uh, is isotropic if and only if A is a norm from the quadratic extension K adjoins square root of B. Uh, so if it, it's in the image of the norm map from K square root of B cross to K cross. So, well, it's not necessarily a quadratic extension. B could be a square, in which case K joins square root of B is K and this condition is vacuous. But you can also see that if B is a square, then this condition is vacuous. So the, the key case is when B is not a square. Um, and this really is a quadratic extension. Um, and I don't want to give the full proof because it does involve breaking up into cases and such. But let me just give the, I mean, let's just, let's just say, uh, say, say B is not a square, so this is quadratic. And assume this is isotropic. So then you have, again, you can solve AX squared plus BY squared equals one. Um, and that will tell you then that A is, you can just solve for A, right? It's uh, one over X squared minus uh, uh, B times Y over X squared. And then you write this, this is, and you re recognize this as a difference of squares. Um, so this is one over x minus b y over x, uh, minus square root of b y over x times one over x plus square root of b y over x. Um, and that's exactly the same thing as the norm of the element of one over x plus square root of b y over x. So the norm is the, of an element in the field of a quadratic extension is the product of the element by its conjugate. Um, so so this, this gives the, and it's not too difficult to reverse the implication as well. So, this is just, I don't want to give the full details in this lemma, but uh, just to give a basic idea of what's going on. And the reason this is a useful statement is that uh, this, the norm map is a homomorphism. So this subgroup of K cross is closed under multiplication. And that's what we're going to use. So if you, so we're going to be fixing B and letting A vary. And we, now we know that the set of collection of A for which this form is isotropic is actually a subgroup of, of K cross. Um, so that's helpful. Um, that's the non-trivial conclusion we get from this lemma. Um, okay. So now there is another set of lemmas we're going to need, but instead of introducing them at the beginning, I'll I'd rather only talk about them when they're when their need arises. Um, so let me get started on the proof. Um, so. Uh, so proof of Hassan and Kowski. So, well, we have F a quadratic form uh, over Q. So we can write F uh, as, you know, we can diagonalize. That was the, one of the very first theorems we saw about quadratic spaces. You can always choose a basis where it's a diagonal. So in the language of quadratic forms, that means after a linear change of variables, you can get rid of all the cross terms. Um, so and all these AIs are in Q cross. Um, so um, now I want to just at the very beginning do some general reductions. We can simplify, uh, we, can, uh, we can massage this a bit to, to restrict what the AIs can be to make our task easier. Um, so recall that, well, we can always modify 
uh, each AI by a square. All right, that's a, just by another linear change of variables where you just scale the corresponding variable. Um, and using that, you can in particular clear denominators, right? Because you can clear denominators by multiplying by the square of the denominator. That will certainly uh, clear the denominators. Uh, so you can assume all AIs are actually uh, integers, non-zero integers. Um, but then again, we can, we're free to modify the AIs by squares um, and even uh, square free integers. So they're products of distinct primes. We can assume all of the AIs are products of distinct primes. Oh, sorry, I meant to, <laughs> just a sec. Uh, I meant to do it. Uh, um, this was, I meant to do a, a reduction first. We can always assume that AI is equal to one if we want, um, because we're trying, we're only trying, we're, only, we're proving the first part of Haas and Minkowski. So we're only interested in whether F uh, represents zero non-trivially. So we can always divide by a constant and it doesn't affect the question. So by dividing by A1 at the beginning, we can assume A1 is equal to one. And then we use this argument for the rest of the variables. And we, can assume, we see that we can assume that the rest of the variables are square free integers, okay? Um, all the rest of this argument was just variable by variable. Yes, uh, the third is. I was wondering whether you could please uh, quickly explain this this reduction where the first, well, where this a one can be set equal to one. I'm not sure that I that I fully got it. Ah, uh, yes. So the forms f and and a one inverse times f. The question of whether they have a non-trivial zero is equivalent. I get it. I understand okay. it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you just use. Okay. Okay. So now we're again we're going to proceed by induction on the number of variables, but the induction is such that such that we're actually going to have to do the first three cases by hand, or even the first four case. Well. We're going to have to do the first three cases by hand, sort of, in the induction. The induction is that complicated, uh, just because of the form of the tricks you use in the inductive step. So we need to handle and n equals one and two are not too difficult. So <coughs> for n equals one, well, I just said we can assume that f is x one squared, right? And um, well, this doesn't have a non-trivial zero over any field, so it's vacuous, right? There's no, there's no the one, there's no form that satisfies the the home form of a form in one variable which actually satisfies the hypotheses. Um, so, so there's nothing to prove. Um, so n equals two is the first real test. So then we have f is a uh, x one squared plus uh, a two x two squared. And a2 is a square free integer. So now what does it mean that f represents zero? Uh, well, if f is isotropic over q nu, uh, then uh, that tells you just by solving for zero equals x1 squared plus solving for a2 in the expression that you get by setting this equal to zero, uh, you get that a2 is a square non-zero square in Q nu. Uh, and that tells you, so there was maybe some activity in the chat. Uh, is Akil here or not? Because that affects whether I uh, just say, oh. Uh, it seems like every okay, I haven't read it in detail, but it seems like people have resolved their confusions in chat. If there's a confusion in chat that doesn't get resolved by the other participants, then do, do please bring it to my attention because I actually have trouble following the chat when I'm lecturing. Um, okay, so, right. And that tells you then, well, first of all, that uh, A2 is positive. That's what you learn when uh, nu is equal to infinity. So the squares and the real numbers are just the positive numbers. But you also learn that the p-adic valuation of A2 uh, is even for all primes p. So, you have a positive square free integer, which has even p adic valuation for all p. It has to be one. 
So it's a, it's a product of distinct primes. If there are any primes occurring, then the p-adic valuation for that prime would be, uh, would be one, right? Which is not even. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and yeah, oh, so it's a, it's a plus or minus one times a product of distinct primes, but since it's positive. Yes, there's a question. I didn't see who asked, but I saw it appear. Uh, shouldn't it be negative A2? Sorry? Shouldn't it be negative A2 or negative oh, uh, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, yeah. So it, uh, A2 is then equal to minus one. That's the only possibility. Uh, or minus a2 is equal to one. Yeah, and that tells you that f is the hyperbolic plane, um, which represents zero over any field. So in particular, over the rational numbers. Uh, so, I mean, it's isotropic, um, right? So there was some activity going on here, right? Basically the claim is that a, a rational number is a square if and only if it's a square in q nu for all nu. And there's something going on there, right? It's not completely trivial, but on the other hand, it's fairly elementary. Um, okay, so that was the n equals two case. There was some activity, but not much. So the real um, the real work is going to start when we look at the case of three variables. So so again, we will have uh, um, x one squared plus a two x two squared uh, plus a three x three squared. Um, let me rename, since we only have three variables, let me rename things a bit. Uh, let's say that this is, um, yeah, I don't know, ax squared uh, plus, I could have made this minus one if I want. So I'll, I'll put it in the form we had earlier. Um, I, I could have made the first coefficient minus one if I wanted. And again, a and b are square free integers. Now we're going to, uh, so. We will prove the desired statement by induction on uh, absolute value of A plus absolute value of B. Um, so, uh, So well, why can we make this? Uh, why can we make this change of variables? A x squared plus b x two minus x two. Yeah, it's because well, in the argument I gave for the general reduction, I said you can make the first coefficient equal to one, but you can actually just as well make the first coefficient equal to any non-zero scalar. You could also make it equal to minus one. It's just the same argument. You divide through by minus one, and it doesn't change the question of whether the form is isotropic. Um, so I'm not. It doesn't directly follow from what I said, but it follows from the same reasoning. We can make one of the coefficients any arbitrary thing we like. In particular, we can make it minus one. Um, and then we do the same argument for the other two coefficients to make them square free integers. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, to do this, right. Ah, right. So we're doing an induction. So I should probably handle the base case. Um, um, I guess the base case is when absolute value of A plus absolute value of B is less than or equal to, well, it has to be equal to two um, because these are non-zero integers. Uh, then there are only four cases, right? So A and B are both equal to plus or minus one. Uh, and uh, Right, and the only case uh, where there's not a solution uh, in Q uh, is where uh, A equals uh, minus one and B equals minus one, but then there's no solution in R. So, so the local global principle holds. And in fact, you only need to look at the one place, the, the real numbers. Um, okay. Right. So now we're assuming that uh, A plus B is greater than three. Um, and the, the key claim or the, the lemma I wanna prove 
uh, is that um, um, yeah, A is a square mod B. Um, uh, so proof. Um, so right, uh, so B is a product of distinct primes since B is square free. So by the Chinese remainder theorem, it suffices to show that A is a square mod P for all primes P dividing B. Um, now, to do this, we're going to use the hypothesis that uh, ax squared plus by squared uh, minus z squared uh, equals 0 has a solution. Sometimes I'm going to say has a solution when I mean has a non-trivial solution. I hope it's um, not too confusing uh, in QP. Um, great. Um, well, we can always, this is a homogeneous equation, so we can always clear denominators uh, and get that we have a solution in ZP. Um, and then we can further, uh, again, because of homogeneity, we can further arrange that, um, uh, well, that the solution have, is primitive. So, uh, uh, so where say VP of X of, uh, where, um, you know, either or VP of Z is equal to zero. So we can always, um, yeah, just by multiplying by powers of P, you can always arrange uh, this kind of stuff. So a primitive solution. Um, uh, but now, uh, now recall that P divides B. Um, so let me see if I can uh, arrange this properly. Yeah. So, uh, we have, uh, we have that uh, P divides, well, B times Y, and therefore P divides uh, AX squared minus Z squared. Um, uh, and what I want to say is that then, um, well, I want to say that you can divide. So in other words, uh, AX squared minus Z squared uh, is congruent to zero mod P. And I want to say that this, uh, uh, or uh, AX squared is congruent to Z squared mod P. And I want to say that this implies that A is a square mod P. So, and you're done. Of course, I need to justify that you can divide through by X, but, um, so I need to justify that X is a, a unit in ZP, or in other words, that X is not divisible by P. But if X were divisible by P, then Z would be divisible by P. Um, and then um, if Z is divisible by P, uh, then, uh, yeah, then, well, then you, get, you, would have, you have to look at it a little bit to figure it out, but you'd get a contradiction to primitivity. Then you'd be able to cancel a further P from all of the three variables here. So. And again, I don't want to go into all the, the little details of the proof, but this is the main idea here. So you get, since, since P divides B, you get P divides this, which gives you exactly the kind of congruence you're looking for. And you need to make sure everything really works, but um, it does. Uh, right, so that was the proof that A is a square mod B. And now let's write out what this means explicitly. So this gives you a, a, a B prime uh, in Z such that, um, so A is congruent to, uh, sorry, so it's that, uh, uh, yeah, B prime in Z and an X in Z. Oh, and I shouldn't use X, I'm sorry, guys. Um, 
what should I use? Uh, yeah, t. Uh, yeah, so, so it's that a minus t squared is equal to b times b prime. Okay. And now we're going to use this lemma we had about uh, this, uh, this equation having a solution over any field. This equation is going to have a solution um, if and only if A is a norm from uh, uh, Q adjoined square root of B. Or actually, I'm switching the roles of A and B for the purposes of this argument. So, um, so now we'll note that we can recognize this as a norm. So this is, a, again, as a difference of squares, we can write this as um, square root of A minus T times minus square root of A, uh, what is it? Uh, why am I having trouble writing differences of squares? Um, sorry, let me flip it around and write T squared minus A, T squared minus A, so I don't get myself confused. So that's T minus square root of A times T plus square root of A. So in other words, this thing is a norm uh, from uh, uh, Q nu adjoin, uh, Square root of a. So then that tells you that the fact that this form here is isotropic uh, implies, and this fact is equivalent to saying that the form ax squared plus b prime y squared minus z squared equals zero uh, is, iso uh, is isotropic uh, over q nu for all nu. But you can also run the same argument over Q and see that the question of isotropy over Q for these two forms is equivalent. Um, uh, yeah, so if there is, there's a question. Uh, yeah, it's actually just uh, uh, at the end of your proof of that, that intermediate lemma about how A has to be a square mod B yeah. at the very end. So you, you, we have this equation A, A x squared is equal to Z squared mod P and then you divide by X squared on both yeah. sides. But isn't it possible that well, VP of X is not equal to zero. I mean, we, we, we said before that VP of X is equal to zero or VP of Y or VP of Z. Yeah, if, that was just my, yeah, that was my very primitive way of saying what a, a primitive solution means. But if you look at the specifics of the equation, so first of all, um, yeah, so let's, if you look at the equation, so, um, so if, P, if P divided X, then P would also have to divide Z, right? Um, yeah, because it divides P as well. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so then, um, but then this would have odd valuation and this would have odd valuation. So uh, if, this were, if this were the one that was a unit, so the only possibility to rule out is that if this is the one that's a unit. Like but then one. if this one's a unit, this would have, uh, oh, sorry, this would have even p-adic valuation and this would have even p-adic valuation. But then this would have odd p uh, this would have odd p-adic valuation because P only divides B once. And then you'd have a contradiction to this being equal to zero, which has even p-adic valuation. So you need to you need to look a little bit about the specifics of the equation and use the fact that p is only dividing b once. But I, I, I believe me, it, uh, I didn't explain why, but it, it checks. So basically, um, in what you said, if if we assume that p doesn't that p divides x, then we would get on this equation a x squared plus b y squared minus z squared is equal to zero. We would get p-adic valuation equal to one on the left-hand side, but well, not equal to one on the right-hand side, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean, you'd be able to, you'd see that there's Infinity. a p in all of x, y, and z, basically. Uh, and then you'd be able to cancel that p and make it more primitive. Um, yeah. Yeah. I see. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Right. So what I, I was just explaining this trick that I call the bb prime switcheroo. So, if you have an equation bb prime equals t squared minus a, then your questions of isotropicity of these quadratic forms for b and b prime are equivalent by this lemma about the norms we stated earlier. So we can actually transfer our question from b to b prime. And now the claim is going to be that we've made our thing we're inducting on swap smaller by switching from b to b prime. And to show this, you just you know solve for b prime and uh, yeah. And well, we have to choose t a little bit more carefully, right? So we're we're making an we're trying to solve an equation mod b. We can always assume that t is uh, less than or equal to absolute value of b over two, right? By choosing the minimal uh, residue class um, representing the square. But if you if you choose t like this and you solve for b prime, you will learn that uh, absolute value of b prime is smaller than the absolute value of b, and then you conclude the argument by induction. So since we know the Hasse-Minkowski theorem for this equation, because it's smaller, because the coefficients are smaller, um, we get that we have a, 
uh, a non-trivial zero for this one, but that's the same thing as having a non-trivial zero for this one by the BB prime switcheroo. Um, so that is the uh, essence of the argument. And I, it looks like I'm not even getting to uh, n equals four here, which involves kind of a different set of tricks. Um, so I'll tell you what, why don't I uh, continue, uh, continue next time? And it's not as bad an idea as it sounds because I was kicking some of the crucial lemmas to the exercises. So uh, this way you'll be, <laughs> you guys could be doing some of the legwork for me. There's an interesting set of theorems which goes by the name weak approximation. Maybe I'll give you a little introduction to what's on the exercise since it's not coming up in the lecture. So eventually we're gonna have to go from some local solution of an equation to some global solution of an equation, right? Um, and the forms of the equations are such that we're always free to modify by squares. Um, and so that, well, let, there's, a, there's a, a theorem called weak approximation. So, uh, which is all about going from a local, local thing to something global. So uh, let me just state the theorem. So if X, I'll state one form of the theorem. If S is a finite set of places of Q, and xv uh, in qv, or nu, sorry, uh, epsilon v in r greater than zero. Um, yeah, and you're given such things, an x nu and q nu and an epsilon nu and r greater than zero for all nu, nu and s uh, are given. Then there exists a global thing, an x in q, such that uh, it's epsilon nu away from x nu for all new in S. Or in other words, uh, the map from the rational numbers to the product over new in S of Q new is dense. So the inclusion of Q in the product of finitely many of its completions is always dense. So we know this for one, if S has one element, because by definition, these Q news were completions of Q. So Q is dense in them. But the claim is actually, even if you just, if you take finitely many, it's still dense. Um, so you can approximate, yeah, like this. And yeah, I did also didn't, I told you that, <laughs> so that's, there, a, a, there are variants on this theorem and some of them appear in your problem set. Um, and we'll be using them in the next lecture to deal with the higher variable cases. And in particular, I haven't yet used, a, you'll notice in, in n equals one, two, and three, we haven't used Hilbert product forming. We haven't used Dirichlet's theorems on primary arithmetic progression. So we haven't somehow hit the, the key points yet. Um, and it'll, it'll be thanks to theorems like this that we'll be able to use this, the Hilbert product formula. But this is, this is the way, one way you can go from Q nu to Q. And the fact that you only get it up to an epsilon is not going to be a big deal because um, another exercise on your problem set will tell you that if you're a, if you're epsilon, if you have a fixed number x nu and you have anything else epsilon close to, to it, if then that one will be a square if and only if, well, if you know, sorry, if you have, yeah, then, then they'll differ by squares. Um, so uh, multiplicatively. And then with our quadratic equations, we can always replace things by squares without changing things. So. Well, I feel like all of this will make more sense in the next lecture. Um, okay, so that's all for today. Uh, if there are any questions. So in the last uh, uh, line that you wrote up, uh, is that the mod in mod x minus uh, x nu uh, sub nu? Yeah, the last thing I wrote, let me share my screen again. I didn't. I didn't quite hear your question. So if you could repeat it, I'd be grateful. Um, uh, the norm is the new. Uh, the new norm. Uh, oh yes, thank you so much. It's the new attic norm. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Uh, yes, Alfredo. Uh, just you know, thinking about this this weak approximation theorem and how maybe, and just wondering if there's like some kind of similar, more general result in the sense that, like, if I have 
uh, in the general, like for general metric spaces, if I have a, you know, a dense isometric embedding of a, of a metric space into its completion, isn't it, would, would it or would it not be true in general that if I, well, basically if I took an, would it, I, I, don't, I don't know if it would be an embedding. If I basically took a product of those embeddings where I send that space to like one, two, three of its completions, and in the first coordinate, it's the first isometric embedding. And in the second coordinate, it's the second one. And in the third coordinate, it's, a, it's the third one. Would that map also be dense? Just no. thinking of it like a, as a generalization of that. No, no, this is not a general fact. Let me give you two examples, which are both very important in number theory. Um, yes, so one example would be if you take just uh, integers with the prime p inverted. Uh, as your your metric space, uh, well, no, I mean, I guess you have two different metrics on it, right? So what I want to say is that if you complete this with the p-adic metric, you still get all of qp. You don't need all of q to fill out qp. It's enough to have integers and then be able to divide by p, right? So that that is also, so this is still dense in qp. On the other hand, it's also still dense in r. Um, so both QP and R are completions of Z bracket one over P. However, Z bracket one over P uh, sitting inside QP cross R, this is a very good exercise. Uh, this is not dense. Uh, in fact, the, the quotient is, is Hausdorff. Uh, and in fact, also compact, so that's so it, it sits very nicely in there. So it's, and, and that, this is analogous to uh, Z sitting inside R. So Z sits beautifully inside R. And the reason is they're not, is the integers are not too scrunched together. So uh, the quotient is Hausdorff. And, um, but they're still relatively close to each other. So the quotient is compact. So that's why Z sits beautifully in R. And in a similar manner, Z bracket one over P sits beautifully in QP cross R. A very good exercise. You can also generalize it to finite sets of primes. Um, now, let me give you another example. Uh, again, important in number theory. Um, so let's take uh, the ring of integers of the quadratic extension adjoined by, uh, you get by adjoining the square root of two, just for example. Um, this uh, is, again, dense inside the reals. So. Well, because you can make rational numbers arbitrarily close to the square root of two, basically. Um, well, I, I, it, let's take that as an exercise as well. Z bracket square root of two is dense inside the real numbers. But it's also dense inside the real numbers in a different way, but via, via a different injection, a different ring homomorphism, where you send square root of two to minus square root of two. So you compose with the, the conjugation map you have on this ring before you include into the real numbers. So. So in other words, this quadratic extension Q is square root of two, we say it has two real places, which differ by, uh, by Galois conjugation. So it sits inside the reals by, just by definition. But on the other hand, you're algebraically speaking, you can just as well replace square root of two by minus square root of two. And then that gives a different embedding in the real numbers. And again, we have the, the similar situation. So Z bracket square root of two sitting inside R cross R is uh, yeah, uh, yeah is discrete and discrete so the quotient is Hausdorff and co-compact so the quotient is compact so if you I, I encourage you to plot this it's very beautiful you can make the z bracket square root of two you can it looks all scrunched up when you just have one copy of the real numbers but when you have the other copy of the real numbers you get a beautiful lattice and I encourage you to plot it it's it's quite fun. Uh, but you'll see all of a sudden it pops out and forms a lattice. And now you can really see the elements of Z bracket square root of two. And this is extremely important for, for studying the arithmetic of these uh, real quadratic fields. Um, yes, Eleutherius. And just to be clear by the quotient, you mean the quotient of the target, uh, of the target space modulo the image of the, of the map? Yes, and the map is an injection. So, um, yeah, so that is a... I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. By the way, you could ask what the analog is so for the rational numbers. So apparently, it's not enough to just take finitely many places. Uh, yeah. 
you, know, you don't get a beautiful picture of the rational numbers. To get a beautiful picture of the rational numbers, you need to do something more involved called the Adels. I won't tell you what it is, but you can look it up. It's a, a, a very clever way of combining all the chiatic numbers for all P with the real numbers. And here, again, it's discrete and co-compact. And that is why the Adels are, essentially why the Adels are so useful. That's how you want it. If you, if you want to visualize the Adels, so to, uh, to visualize the rational numbers, so to speak, in the same way as you visualize the integers, you have to use the Adels replacing the real numbers. But of course, uh, it's difficult for everyone to visualize the Adels. So this is kind of, um, yeah. Yes. Justin? Yes. Uh, maybe an even simpler example uh, would be the rationals embedded in the reals, and then take two copies of that. So the rational, a rational number will now be embedded in reals cross reals by sending it to the diagonal element, the rational itself. Yeah. Or you could compose it with reflection in the reals, and then it's on the anti-diagonal. Yeah. But clearly not this. Yeah, yeah. So um, yes, indeed. Yeah. So I was giving examples where what the embedding is not dense, but yet it's still fundamental and very useful. So that was doing more than was required by the question. And yeah, there are also these other kinds of examples showing that you shouldn't expect density in general. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, about the hausmann minkowski theorem. Yes. Uh, is it also possible if you are given the solutions over all piatic fields uh, to like construct a solution over Q or is it only telling something about the existence? It's only telling you something about the existence. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not one of the kinds of people who study these questions about um, making things explicit, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. all I can say is that if you look at the argument, it doesn't tell you how to find the zero. It just proves that one exists. I don't know if you're sufficiently clever and have a sufficiently detailed understanding of all the ingredients in the argument, whether you can, with a lot of work, turn it into an algorithm. That is very much not clear to me whether that's possible or not. And in particular, I, I, I don't know the, whether someone has done it. I, maybe Akilo, do you know this kind of thing? Uh, uh, sorry, algorithm for what? I, I... Oh, like like finding a rational solution when you if you know one exists. Uh, I yeah I don't know sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I guess maybe yeah I mean I guess if you, I mean you can always just search. I guess you can always search for a solution with brute force, right? Like uh, by you know order by height, meaning, uh, you know, absolute value of the numerator plus absolute value of the denominator, just brutally. And if you know there's a solution, you're going to hit one eventually. But I don't know if there's an algorithm that's guaranteed to terminate in finite, I mean, in amount of time that you can a priori bound. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. No, can I ask a question? Sorry, was there another question? Uh, yes. So this like uh, this weak approximation is about like embedding Q into this product of this finite product, right? So yeah. like, is it possible to like combine all of the, like, cause right as, as it sounds now, it's like a statement for each finite subset. So is there a nice way to like combine everything into a single statement or? Um, I mean, in general, it, finite subsets often arise. And so it, it's like the, yeah, you use flexibility in choosing the finite subset, but th there is a way indeed, again, using the Adels. So there's a, if you can, you can look up the definition of Adels and you can also take the Adels, but remove one of the factors, like say Q5 or something like this. And then the, another form of weak approximation will tell you that, you know, so Q is sits in discreetly inside the Adels, but if you remove just one of the factors, then it sits densely inside um, any one of the factors. So this is kind of a, um, but then again, you have this arbitrary one factor you're emitting. And so it's just in some sense, just as bad as your arbitrary finite set, I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I think some other, yeah, I don't think there's any, uh, I don't know. I, I basically don't know. 
Okay, so I guess the lesson is that adults are like a nice way to think about it, or like things like this. I think so, but they take a lot of getting used to, and there is something to be said for keeping things. Mm, I don't know. I think I think you can spend your whole life getting really comfortable with the Adels, and then some people have done it, and now they write all their papers with Adels. Um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Also, Matthew is asking if there's a proof of Hasse Minkowski which is less ad hoc, and Akil says if you yeah. Peel says if you do it for all field, a number of fields at once, you can use class field theory to help. Um, but I don't really know any argument that I would consider not ad hoc. Um, well, I guess I just meant that then you, for example, you're not using uh, Dirichlet's theorem. Um, right. And I guess maybe you're also not using this sort of inductive argument at uh, n equals three, though. Um, but yeah, but I guess you're still sort of inducting on the number of variables. Yeah, and then there's a, but then you can say, okay, are there any proofs of the theorems of class field theory that are not ad hoc? And that's that's a whole other question. I mean, but uh, and yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes, there is. Uh, I also wanted to ask, why is the weak approximation theorem called the weak approximation theorem? It's because there's something called the strong approximation theorem, which I believe is the statement I just said with the Dells. I, I'm not so up on the terminology. Uh, or was that noise? That one's still weak. Uh, let, let's Google it. Here, let me Google that for you. No, sorry. Um, you do it too. Thanks. No, you can let, oh, maybe you you do it. Uh, you Google strong approximation theorem and see what comes up. Uh, I, I think it's the same one I just explained. I think uh, strong approximation lets you control um, at the places the the finite places uh, for for a finite subset still, um, but also allowing you to have um, something with norm less than one at all the other places or less than equal to one. Okay, so this is a, a statement of this kind of form is on your problem set. So, um, yeah. Uh, what is weak approximation? What is strong approximation? Anyway, I'll let you guys Google it. It's been a long time since I've looked into this. But yeah, I guess that's exactly giving you um, an adelic statement, right? Because then at all but finitely many places, you have a piatic integer and not just a number. Yeah, but there's a question then of like, um, how all but finitely many can you get? Because in the, in, the, yeah, in the form I have on the problem set, you can actually make it all except one. And that uses Dirichlet's theorem on mm -hmm. primes and arithmetic progressions. But yeah, if you just have it for all but some unspecified finite number, then it is the same, I guess, the same as the same for the Adels um, by what you just said. Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, Sundara. And uh, um, hmm. uh, I just uh, want to ask, uh, so uh, in the last page of what you have written, so, uh, so uh, you, you said Q is inside the finite product. Uh, uh, of over s of q comma uh, q mu. So uh, I want to ask, how does it sit inside? What is the explicit map? The, the map from q to the product over nu of q nu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, good question. So on the nth factor, it's just the inclusion of q into q nu. Also, uh, the, uh, so the lattice of uh, Z root two uh, you drew in R cross R. Uh, yes. I suppose uh, you are taking so Z root two is a two-dimensional module over Z. So I suppose 
what you're trying to draw there is uh, you're taking one of the bases as root two and one of the bases as one, and then you're trying to draw the sublattice inside out. Yes, indeed. So there's another way of thinking about this. Instead of yeah, I mean, yeah, you you know that every lattice indeed fits inside a real vector space of the same dimension, and you can just tensor up, and you get it right. So if m is free of rank two, and you take m tensor r then you get a beautiful real vector space in which it sits. And then this can be rephrased as identifying what Z bracket square root of two tensor R is. Namely, it's just two copies of R. Um, uh, two, I mean, as a ring even, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's R cross R as a ring via these two different real embeddings of Z bracket square root of two. So yeah, there's two different ways of, of looking at this. I actually do prefer the way you, you said where you, you have the tensor product with R a priori and then you try to ask what it is explicitly. Um, yes, I think that's the best um, best perspective. Yeah. I think a castle, yeah, to answer Akil in the comments, I, I think Castle's Florlich is the canonical reference. And since it's been the canonical reference for so long, probably no one's tried to do anything better than it. At least they haven't, to my understanding, or to my knowledge. Uh, Oh, yes, oh, there is. Uh, are there like, uh, aside from this, uh, some cubic analog of Hassan Minkowski not actually holding because of Zellmer's example, are there like other cases where local global principle just fails? It's more, you should rather be asking if there are more cases where it holds. Um, that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it, it fails as a, as a general rule. Um, so it's really only in specific cases that it holds. But in, there are also other cases where it, where it holds. Um, so uh, yeah, but I'm not, the, I'm actually not the right person to ask this. I'm not, yeah. Um, why don't you look at, I think maybe there's a good discussion. So Poonin has notes, Bjorn Poonin, I'll type it in the chat. Poonin has notes. Um, oh, uh, uh, rational points on varieties, I think. I think that's what it's called. Um, and anything Poonin writes is just exceptionally clear. Um, and this is exactly about the topic of the general study of rational points on varieties, which is kind of what this question is about. And I think there's a section in there that discusses um, Asa Minkowski. Ah, someone has found it and linked to it. Thank you very much, Eleutherios, yes. Um, and I recommend those notes for all sorts of purposes, um, but in particular for this question, I think, I think there's a discussion of what in general holds. I see, thank you. Yeah. Ah, Nikhil's putting pointing out another good example. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. There is a yeah. There is some statement describing W of Q in terms of the W of the Q news. Some analog of Tate's calculation, basically. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know it off the top of my head, but yeah. But again, I don't think that. Yeah, maybe I think Akil touched on this earlier. I don't quite know how to go from that statement to Hassan Minkowski. Um, oh yes, uh, Garrett. Uh, okay, you you sound like a robot. Yeah, I, I can't hear. It's a little better. Uh, or no, it's not. Okay, that, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but it sounds like you're speaking robot language. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's really weird. I wish you could hear yourself. <laughs> Maybe you can type your question in the chat. Great, right, great. What's so special about quadratic forms that you can go from, oof, I don't know. Uh, well, I, 
I don't know how to answer that question. The proof works is kind of the silly answer. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the quadratic forms are simple enough that you have a hope, I guess. I don't know. I'm, uh, but then you really have to check and see. I don't know. Uh, Akhil, do you have a better answer? Oh, sorry. I was responding to an earlier question. Um, well, I guess quadratic forms, uh, I mean, I guess they are like torsors over the orthogonal group. And I think there are these general statements for, for torsors, which are supposed to be generalizations of, of that. But yeah, I also don't know what the sort of state of the art on Asim and Kowski um, for more general um, varieties is. Is Garrett, is your question why quadratic forms in particular and not say cubic or higher forms? <laughs> Don't apologize, Garrett. It's not your fault, I'm sure. And it was kind of fun. Um, Any more would questions? Quest, sorry, would that question be like uh, Fermat's last theorem? In when we have exponents too, then we have many solutions. But when exponents are bigger, then we don't. Is that what's happening here? Well, I don't know if there's a I don't know if there's a relation between those phenomena. Um, maybe. I, mean, I guess just one thought. Go ahead. I'm sorry, just to go back to like this cohomological discussion. I mean, maybe one idea is that quadratic forms, since they they form a nice algebraic structure, this vit ring, which is closely related to like the cohomology of the field. Whereas if you're studying some you know other more general class of varieties, then there's sort of no analog of the vit ring. And the vit ring, I mean the I mean the Hassam and Kowski can I guess so if if you formulate it for all number of fields at once, it it, it is equivalent to a statement about the vit ring, and then so it's going to follow from a statement about sort of Galois cohomology, which is part of the the class field theory set up, but I mean, I don't know that, that, that was just one thought. Right, that's a really good point. Yeah, um, that there's one general setting in which you do have a, uh, a local global principle and it's a um, Galois cohomology. So you can kind of, well, at least, well, you don't always have it literally in the, that statement, but you can at least understand the discrepancy between the global and the local. This, you can say things about it, and there are beautiful general theorems describing what's going on there. So, as opposed to the case of algebraic varieties, points on varieties, which is there aren't uh, general descriptions, there's just a vast zoo of phenomena. So, I guess what Akil is saying is that one should hope for a, a local global principle in the setting of varieties if you can rephrase the existence of a rational point um, in terms of some kind of uh, Galois cohomology or. Or some similar thing like that, some some similar invariant like a bit ring or whatever. So that's yeah, that's I, I like that answer a lot. Thanks, Akil. Yeah. Thank you for all the answers for everything. All right. Okay. So I'll see you in some other activities. I do have office hours right now, but I don't have evening office hours on Friday. And I'll change them for next week. You'll find out. Okay. See you guys Bye. on Monday.